All right, well, good morning. Glad that you guys are all able to be here today. Uh, we've got uh, one extra, and we got one that isn't here. So we just got we just swapped somebody out, I think. But uh, it's good to be here today. We're glad that you guys are all able to be here. We just sang that song, I'd Rather Have Jesus. You think about that. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain. You believe that? You think that? Is that really what you believe? Because we sure spend an awful lot of time in this world trying to pursue and have as much as we possibly can sometimes, don't we? Um, you know, having things is not wrong. Uh, I think the difference often becomes is where is your heart, right? What is it that you are truly pursuing? But I loved, I just, I don't know, these words jumped out at me this morning. Then to be the king of a vast domain. You know, sometimes if we're honest with ourselves, it'd be really hard to turn down that offer. But that next sentence says, be held in sin's dread sway. You know what we want? We want Jesus Christ. We want the eternal life. We want eternal freedom. We want the deliverance from sin that he alone can provide. And what we really want is to be led by his hand, right? Not by this world, not by riches, right? We want to be led by him. I just, uh, I don't know. That song kind of jumped out at me this morning as we sang it. So um, just couldn't help but get up here and share some of the thoughts that were going through my head as we were singing that song. All right, we are going to be back in the book of Matthew. Uh, pray for me today and tonight and however long this goes on here. Um, there's just so much packed in these couple chapters, and I am really struggling and going back and forth between do we, do we entrench ourselves now uh, in what could be a very long study um, and not make it to the end of Matthew, for a little while, or do we try to just summarize a little bit of this and keep moving and then come back at some point? I really, after having went through this, uh, whether we do it now or we do it later, I really do believe that we need to come back and spend some time uh, thinking about uh, the end of this world and the things that are coming, right? The prophecies that the Lord has shared the things that we believe have happened, the things that we believe are yet to come. Um, you know, obviously, uh, in Thessalonians, Paul is a strong believer in the fact that the Lord is coming back and there's going to be a trump and we're all going to be called up to meet him in the air. Um, listen, we need to be living our lives like that event is coming, right? Matter of fact, the only reason that I have not moved on yet is because I want everybody to understand how much Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25 are driving home, be ready, right? Um, I get caught up in these chapters because of the prophecy and what does it mean about, you know, the signs that are going to be in the heavens and what does it mean about... You know, all of the stuff that's going to happen and when is that happening and what's it happening. And sometimes you can get so wrapped up in all of those things that you actually miss the most obvious point, which is you need to be doing now what I want you doing because time will run out. You need to be watching and ready because things are going to happen, right? And sometimes I think we can get so wrapped up trying to put every dot and every 
I dotted and every T crossed and what does this word mean and where's this fit in the prophecy and what does this mean? And we can get so wrapped up in that, we just miss the point. And so I want to come back through, I'll be honest, I almost just jumped into chapter 5 because last time, if you remember, we did talk about what history says about the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, we read Matthew chapter 24, and I had some comments, pretty high-level comments. I was tempted to come back today and just start in chapter 25 and talk about the parable of the ten virgins. But as I was reading over it again, coming in this morning, um, I just thought, you know what, I'm just not quite ready to leave chapter 24. Um, and so pray for me today as we do this, because I'm doing this honestly I was ready to talk about chapter 25. Um, so we're coming back here to chapter 24. And if it's a little choppy today, you're going to have to realize it's because my notes are for chapter 25, not chapter 24. So um, there, there were a couple things I think that we need to understand about Matthew chapter 24. When you look at verse 3, he is again talking to his disciples privately. This is not a big conversation in front of the multitudes of people uh, the Pharisees aren't there. This is not going on in the temple. They have already left. And they want to know the things that are going to be the sign. Uh, when will these things be? And when he says, when will these things be, that's talking about the destruction of the temple because that's what he had just told them. And then they ask about when are the signs of thy coming because he's told them already that he's coming back for them. If you remember, that's a conversation uh, that, that he has insinuated to them already. And when is the end of the world? That is, in my mind, a different question because they are now asking, when is the world going to end? Now, in their mind, those things may all happen at the same time. Well, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, the Lord's going to come back, and the end of the world is going to be. Well, obviously, that's not the case because Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, and you and I are here, right? This is, if you remember, last time we talked about the fact that um, there was an analogy given that when you look at prophecy, you often have to look at it as if you're looking out over a mountain range. And you can see this peak and this peak and this peak. But from here, they all look like they're super close together. Matter of fact, the one in the middle actually might be further back. Like from here, looking at it, it looks like it's in the middle, but actually it's further away. It's that idea that when you look at this, understand that some of what he's saying may be right here and some of it may be quite a distance off. The Lord's vision for how all this plays out uh, is not bound by time like yours and I. Like me and you, just give it to me. Like this is happening next week and this is happening a month from now and this is happening a year from now. Right? That's the way we think, right? The Lord just gives us these prophecies and sometimes there's thousands of years between them. We think something must be wrong, but in reality, when the Lord says this is the beginning of those trials, we think, well, those trials are going to be super short. Listen, the Lord says when this is the beginning, 2,000 years later, we may still be seeing some of those things come to be. The Lord does not have this same constraint of time that you and I do. So just keep that in mind. Um, quick summary, as you look at verses 4 down through verse 14, uh, and if this is not what you believe, that's totally fine. I, I guarantee you there's a bunch of different opinions when it comes to Matthew chapter 24. To some degree, I think he is talking specifically to his believers here in these verses right here. Because he says, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Listen, that statement is still true today. That was not a statement that was meant to be, well, from this point to when the destruction of Jerusalem comes, you need to be careful because there will be false Christs. That is still happening today. That was a warning for the Lord's people from then until the end. Now, I think it's going to ramp up, right? There have been different people that have come claiming to be Christ or to be Christ-like. There is coming a time when there will be one who is the ultimate deceiver, right? 
And I believe that there are many like him, but there is coming one that will truly be the Antichrist and will try to deceive many. Verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Now again, between that time and the destruction of Jerusalem, were there rumors of wars and stuff? I'm sure there were. Were there famines and things? I'm sure there were. But listen, if you look out over the last 2,000 years, we have almost been in a constant state of war and turmoil. Look at the recent history. I mean, look at the recent history. I mean, nation shall rise against nation. World War I ended in like 1918. Pretty well involved almost every major nation in the world. Listen, there had been plenty of wars and things before that, usually regionalized. This was almost every nation. It wasn't that much longer. I mean, World War II really, we think about World War II starting in the 40s. In reality, World War II started in the late 30s. And again, you find nation against nation. You got the Korean conflict, the Vietnam War, the war on the Iraq War, the, the, the war on terror. I mean, listen, we've been in a constant state of war for more than 100 years almost. And that's just from the American perspective. You look out over any given time when we think of a time of peace. Listen, there is some country somewhere that is in the middle of a civil war or is in a war. It's constant. Earthquakes. Pestilence. Hey, we just came out of three years of the COVID pandemic. Back in 1918, they had three years of the Spanish flu. We think about pestilence, right? Disease and all this other stuff. The earthquake in Turkey and Syria, man, that is a heartbreaking event. You know that the death toll for that earthquake is beyond 24,000 people now. That is a massive number of people. He said in verse 8 that when you hear of these things, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, in divers places, that is another key part of that statement. It's not just that there's going to be an earthquake and there's going to be some pestilence. Listen, in a multitude of places, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Listen, he is not talking about Jerusalem at that point. He is talking about his disciples. Jerusalem was not hated because of Jesus Christ's name. He is not talking about the nation of Israel at this point. He's talking about his people. Now listen, a lot of what he describes happened to the apostles. Honestly, a lot of what he described happened to the apostles before the destruction of Jerusalem. Did you know, and we don't really associate this very much, but in A.D. 70, almost all of the 12 apostles were dead. History tells us there was probably one left. John is probably the only one that actually lived to see the destruction of Jerusalem. In other Gospels, we learn that it was, I think it was, I'd have to go look, but I think it was like Peter, James, and John that were the three that were privately asking Jesus about this. Listen, of those three, two of them never lived to see the destruction of Jerusalem. Talks about that they'll be delivered, they'll be hated, uh, they'll be offended and betrayed. Many false prophets will arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He is not, in my opinion, in those words, talking about from uh, 19, 
or not 19, you know, from the year 33 to the year 70, that the love of many is going to wax cold, but if you'll endure to the end, well, if, well, enduring to the end, I don't think that's talking about if you'll endure past, 19, uh, past 70 A.D., Right? This is a longer term conversation that he is having with his people, warning them about things to come. And that, listen, for you guys, listen, sorrow is going to start, but that's just going to be the beginning. And I believe that much of what he's describing is not just crammed into that 30, 40 year time period. This is something that he is warning us about and telling us for much to come. And listen, I believe that a lot of what's described there is only going to get worse the closer we get to the Lord's return. Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Listen, there are some people that look at this verse and say, well, by the time A.D. 70 come, because of the works of Paul and others, the gospel had reached all of the known world at that time, and therefore that has fulfilled. I actually don't believe that either. We are still in the process of sharing the gospel. And about the time you feel like it's been shared throughout the whole world, you realize that there's a nation of people that have come up that hardly know anything about the gospel. Now, in verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them be in Judea, flee into the mountains. Let him which is in the housetops not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him come, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not seen in the, since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Now we talked the other day about uh, Josephus' account of what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem, and it was horrible, horrible so destitute that people were chewing on their sandals, so destitute that mothers were eating their own children. Horrible, horrible stuff. Now, I have struggled with this passage, and I'm just going to be honest, right? I have struggled with this passage. Where does this passage fit in regards to prophecy and end times? Has it already happened? Is it yet to come? I actually do believe that to some degree this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And I believe that because of what Luke says about this same account. Now, I am not going to tell you that it's not possible that there is multiple times that are going to fit this. Actually, when you look at what Daniel said, a lot of what Daniel said actually fits some of the destruction that happened not long after Daniel, or after what Daniel said. Um, so it is possible that this is accounting for the destruction of Jerusalem and yet another event that is to be in the future. I don't know. But after weeks and weeks and weeks of looking at this, I want to read to you the book of Luke. I'm going to read part of it. This is the exact same account um, in, verse, uh, in Luke chapter 21. I'll, just to give you uh, an indication of how this is the exact same thing, verse 6 says, And as for these things which ye beheld, the day shall come, in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Does that sound familiar? In verse 7, And they ask him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign shall there be when these things shall come to pass? And verse 8, And take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. So this is the same passage that we're talking about. Verse 10, he talks about nation shall rise against nation. Verse 11, earthquakes. Verse 12, but before all these things, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you and deliver you. Uh, we see in verse 19, uh, verse 20, 
And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation therefore is nigh. In relation to Matthew, this verse is basically the same as verse 15, which says, when ye, shall, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. In the storyline, uh, verse 20 is basically in the exact same place as verse 15, talking about the desolation spoken of by Daniel, which, and again, this is where we could spend weeks and weeks here. When you get into Daniel, you understand that a lot of that desolation is talking about uh, the temple being <laughs> the temple being polluted, basically, and that um, uh, the temple being destroyed, the temple having um, uh, pagan things worshipped there. Remember, in the destruction of Jerusalem, what happened? Even though the temple got destroyed, the Romans brought in their banners and their uh, their their things that would have been considered polluting of the temple. But now as you remember Josephus' account, I want you to think about that as you read the rest of this. Uh, the armies shall compass, uh, Jerusalem shall be compassed with armies, and then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And listen, when Jerusalem was surrounded, and that time period, if I, I understand there's a whole lot of stuff that went on, but the actual siege of Jerusalem was like four to five months and it was compassed, and you weren't getting out. It was compassed by armies, and the desolation was nigh. Once that happened, Jerusalem was about to be gone and just wiped off the face of the earth. But listen to verse 21. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of the it depart out of it. And let not them that are in the uh, countries enter there and too. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. They ask, when will this thing be? That was one of their questions. When will the Jerusalem and the temple be destroyed? And he says, when you see Jerusalem compassed by armies, listen, flee, because the end is now. And he talks about them being the days of vengeance. By the way, I think that days of vengeance upon the city uh, is, is representative of, and really I say the city, it's the whole nation. Um, it's representative of the things that were described even back in Deuteronomy and other places. If you go from me, if you don't serve me, if you don't follow me, this is what's going to happen. And the days of vengeance had come. We talked a little bit last time. Listen, that is a good reminder the Lord is long-suffering. We are talking about sometimes hundreds, thousands of years between events. But when the Lord said, I am going to bring vengeance, he meant it. It's a good practical remembrance for us. He is long-suffering. But listen, if you're off in a bunch of sin, you need to get it right. Because there's coming a time when the Lord is going to bring judgment. Verse 24 and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. What happened in Josephus' account of the destruction of Jerusalem? They compassed the city. There was great famine. Horrible, horrible death and destruction. The city was destroyed and burnt. The temple was burnt and then tore down and literally eventually the stones dragged away and the ground plowed up. What happened to the people? What do we say? It was like 1.1 million people were killed by the time the siege was over. Fits that verse. They shall die by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. One thing that Josephus said was that they, those that survived were gathered together. And you know what? They picked out some of them and they sent them away as presents to all nations to be used in the theaters and to be used as entertainment. Some of them were sent to the Egyptian mines. Some of them were sold into slavery. Listen, if you were captured... We're not talking about a situation where, 
Well, we went through and we picked you and we're going to let you stay. You were going to sell into slavery and you were going to kill. Listen, you were either killed or you were sold into slavery or you were shipped off to fight in the theaters. That's it. When you read Josephus' account, he doesn't say that they figured out who was guilty and who wasn't and they killed those that were guilty. He says they gathered them together and they figured out who was guilty and they killed them and everybody else was sold into captivity. You remember what I said, that there were so many Jewish people in the day that were sold into slavery that they basically said there was a glut on the market and you could buy a Jewish slave for the same price that you could buy a horse. Like it was just bountiful, in other words, is what they're saying. Listen, that is horrible. I don't mean to talk about those things in any kind of light way. But I'm trying to show you that that fits very well to what this verse just described. And this is the same account as we find in Matthew. And what else? And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. The Romans came in. They destroyed the city. It was no longer a city of the Jewish people. Listen, the Jewish people for a long time had been under Roman captivity. Maybe captivity is the wrong word. Roman rule. But Jerusalem at this point is not even a Jewish city anymore. And what has happened to the city of Jerusalem since then? It's been passed from one Gentile group of people to the next Gentile group of people. Even today, although Jerusalem is now back, Israel is now a nation again, listen, it is a divided city. Matter of fact, if you understand where the Temple Mount is believed to have been is now a Muslim place. There is a mosque and there is something called uh, the Dome of the Rock, which is like the third most important Muslim location in the world. Jerusalem, in many ways, is still a city trodden by Gentiles. So I would be cautious in saying that everything that the Lord told them in this dialogue ended in A.D. 70. It was, in many ways, the beginning of the desolation. And he says, until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In verse 25, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth the stresses of nations and perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. This is where I struggle believing like some people do and if you do that's okay like I said it's a confusing couple chapters people that say all of chapter 24 was fulfilled already I have problems believing that right because the end of the Gentiles is not yet fulfilled the Lord in my opinion has not come back yet now, I will tell you, to be fair, people that believe that Matthew chapter 24 is done and over, I've read multiple things, and, and listen, they have some good arguments. But it assumes some things that we have no actual evidence of. Because you know what? Somebody that believes Matthew 24 is all in the past would say that the Lord actually did come back. And he came back in the skies in A.D. 70 to view and watch over the destruction of Jerusalem. I see no account of that in the scripture. I see no indication of that in the scripture. But that is actually what they would say. Now, much of what they say makes sense, right? Hey, listen, between when the Lord said this and the destruction of the temple, there were a lot of earthquakes, and there were a lot of famine, there was a lot of pestilence. The apostles were killed, they were taken before the synagogues, and then the destruction happened. Even the, even the verse in the last half of Matthew chapter 24 that talks about 
There will be two women grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Me, you, we look at that and we say, well, yeah, when the Son of, when the son of God comes back and he comes back, some of us are going to be taken and some of us aren't. But they actually, again, believe that that has already come to pass. They would say that what that's talking about is the Roman government coming in and taking one and leaving the other. But listen, in my, in my reading of Josephus, there was no coming in and taking one and leaving another. They took it all. They were done. So I just want to be fair in my accounting of this that there are valid arguments and logical arguments for saying that Matthew chapter 24 has all come to be and already all in the past. Even the verse that talks about that the Lord would come and would call his people from the four corners of the earth. I look at that and I think about what Paul talks about when the Lord comes at the last trump and we're all gathered together to be with him in the air. Somebody that believes Matthew chapter 24 has already all come to pass would say, no, that's talking about the gospel being spread. And the gospel is going to go out to the four corners of the earth and that all will hear it. So again, hey, listen, I know some really good, faithful men that believe that. I can't make it click in my mind with the other passages. And Luke really helped me see that, yes, part of this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Because his account there in Luke really does a good job of describing exactly what was going to happen to the city of Jerusalem. But that conversation about what would happen to the end what would happen to Jerusalem ends with this idea that from that point the Gentiles are going to trod down the city and they will stay there until the end of the time the Gentiles is fulfilled that is what would be called a transition statement right yes we're talking about the destruction of Jerusalem but we then transition into other conversations I also struggle a little bit back in Matthew because it talks about, I'll see if I can find it. <clears throat> There's the conversation about, um, oh, where to go? Oh, verse 29. This is, um, he's talked about that, you know, uh, you need to flee Verse 16, he talked about fleeing Judah. Uh, I believe, again, this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem there. Uh, pray that it not be in the winter. There's going to be great tribulation. In verse 29, he says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn. Again, a lot of people, some people would take this and say, well, all this has happened. And the way that they do that is they m turn it into an allegory. Well, the sun really wasn't darkened and the moon wasn't darkened. That's an allegory for, you know, the sorrow that comes with the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, that, the, that the moon, you know, is, is lost her light. That's God's people have lost it. Or different variations of that, right? But Luke helped me. Because it says immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. And I struggled thinking, well, did that really happen? Because if the rest of this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the word immediately is used, well, then was in AD 70, was the sun darkened? Was the moon, did the stars fall? But if you notice, when you look at it in the book of Luke, that verse comes right after talking about when the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. Again, that's a transition statement. That's, that's this idea of, hey, we're talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and the start of the destruction of the Jerusalem is just the start of so many other things that are going to happen. And we're going to enter this time where the Gentiles are going to kind of rule and dominate that area. But there's coming a time when, listen, some things are going to happen. They're going to cause the earth to fear, and men will tremble. So understand, this is probably a good place to use that analogy of the mountain range, right? Well, we're given a whole bunch of information. 
and some of it is soon and some of it is far and some of it is not just a single event. I think that's the other mistake that we make when we read this. We're looking for like event one, event two, event three. He is laying out here a few thousand years of vengeance and desolation and problems that will all come accumulated to another set of very defined events when the Lord comes back. Because there is coming a time when in verse 29, after the Lord, in verse 30, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trump, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. That is not talking about A.D. 70. I know some, some people believe that it is, I just can't make that mesh. This is talking about when the Lord comes back and calls his people and we meet him in the air. I think it's also interesting to notice that it says that he will be seen. We sometimes, I don't know exactly how this is going to happen when the Lord comes back for us. We, we envision that people just suddenly disappear and like nobody knows what happened. This verse actually says, uh, and he shall send his angels the sound of a trump, and they shall gather together the elect. But when you back up, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Now at some point, the whole world is going to see him coming back. And they will see him coming again. And they will mourn, and they will tremble in fear. Now that is when, if you remember last time we read in verse 32, Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know the summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass, till all these things shall be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. When you take that in context of, yes, Part of this chapter is telling them, you as my disciples, these are the things you need to be ready for. These are the things that are going to happen. Many are going to claim to be me that will not be me. Do not go out and see them. Don't follow after them. Point one. Point two, yes, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, the desolation of Jerusalem has come. And there's going to be horrible, horrible things that happen. And that is the beginning of the desolation. And then there's coming a time when the Lord's going to come back and He's going to call His people up to be with Him. And then comes the statement about when you've seen these things, it's like when summer's coming and you see the fig tree start to bloom and now you know summer is nigh. Well listen, when you see this stuff happen, understand the time of the end is near. The end is near. And that generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. Not the generation that he was talking to back around 33 AD. The generation that has seen the Lord come back in the air. That generation shall not pass till the end comes. That is my take on Matthew chapter 24. I struggled getting there just looking at Matthew 24 sometimes. But when you start to look at Mark, and especially you start to tie Luke into it, there is those statements that seem to be pretty good transition statements to kind of maybe draw that idea that, listen, I'm talking about a wide range of time here. And there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen. That's going to happen in my time. Matter of fact, he even says, listen, some of this stuff, only the Father knows the time that this stuff is going to happen. You just need to be ready. <clears throat> and listen, if I am wrong and all of Matthew chapter 24 has already happened, the principle and the concept still applies. There is more yet to come 
and you had better be working and being ready and being watchful. Now what interests me is that people that generally say that Matthew chapter 24 is over and Matthew chapter 25 is yet to come, well, Matthew chapter 24 carries with it a message of you had better be ready. But guess what Matthew chapter 25 carries with it? You had better be watching and be ready. He gives two examples of that in Matthew chapter 25. The den virgins and the talents. And he says, listen, I'm coming back. You had better be ready for me. So I think it's interesting that chapter 24 and chapter 25, they really carry the same message. Are you ready? Because I'm coming. Now, the end of chapter 24 does talk about, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah, so shall this also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in those days they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all the way. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Listen, we know that the time of Noah was a time of great sin. It was a time when people were just all about self and lust and whatever they wanted, right? God basically said, I'm just going to start over. You know what? The last 2,000 years, time of great wickedness. And honestly, it ain't getting any better. There have been times, thankfully, where there's been revival and there's been some turning back to God. But generally speaking, as time goes on, even whenever there's time of revival and things get a little bit better for a short period of time, listen, it doesn't take long until it's worse than it was before the revival. This world is a wicked wicked place and there is much where you can start to see where that which is good is called evil and that which is evil is called good every day that goes by I see more examples of that we can't be far off from what it looked like in Noah's day and listen the other thing I think you need to remember about Noah's day is Noah was out there preaching Noah was out there preaching. He was building the ark. Everybody thought he was nuts. And then one day the Lord put him in the ark and shut the door. And then it began to rain. And then the great depths broke up. And suddenly, even though it was too late, this world realized that Noah had been right the whole time. That is another example of what the end is going to be like. It's not just that they were marrying and giving in marriage and were perfectly fine without God. That's not the only parallel to draw there. The other parallel is they weren't ready. And suddenly, time was up. And now it's too late. And then it goes in and talks about the two that would be in the field, the one taken, the other left. Two grinding at the mill, the one taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Those passages are talking about be ready. Be ready. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. He is talking to his apostles. Now they died. So although he's physically talking to his apostles, he's saying these things for the generations that would come after that. He's speaking to you and me. He's speaking to believers, and he says, when you think not, 
He's going to be here. We need to be careful. We need to be watching and ready. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to him? Give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Listen, he has given us something to do. He has put us in charge of something. He has put us over something. He has given us things to be doing for him. And he says, you know what makes a happy master? When a master comes back and finds his servants doing what he has asked them to do. If the Lord came back today, would he find you doing those things that he had commanded you to do? Or would he find you off just worried about the things of this life? Striving for more. The kingdoms and the silver and the gold that we said this morning that we'd rather have Jesus than those things. Verily, I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat, and to drink with the drunken. And the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour that he is not aware of him, and shall be cut asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> I don't think that people that are saved are going to be lost just if the Lord comes back and they weren't doing what they're supposed to. I think in a lot of ways this is an indication of those that claim to be his, but they're not. And the Lord comes back. They're going to get what they truly deserve. But that doesn't take away from the fact that you and me need to be ready. We need to be watching. Last thing I want is to be counted and looking like those that are not really his to begin with. I want to be the Lord's. And I want people to know that I'm His. And that I'm serving Him. Listen, in preparation for this afternoon, understand that as He's talking here at the end of this verse about being ready and that the servant needs to be ready for the Master, you need to be faithfully doing what the Master says, He says those things and then in chapter 25 gives the parable of the ten virgins. And so this afternoon we'll take some time and we'll talk a little bit about the kingdom of heaven being likened unto ten virgins. All right? We're going to go ahead and be dismissed or we'll dismiss in a song. So if Brother Philip would come and lead us in a song, please. As he comes, we'll go ahead and stand.